The progress of paleontology never stops, with stunning new discoveries being made every year. 2023 has been no different, with some absolutely incredible fossils having been described and many major new studies published. That's why we paleo YouTubers come together each year to document the past 12 months of paleontological discoveries. And once again, Edge Science has very kindly invited me to be a part of this year's Paleo Rewind. This year, I'll be taking a look back at the month of May 2023, and wow, what a month. We had multiple Spinosaur papers published, plus evidence for some giant pliosaurs, a new saber-toothed cat, new mosasaur, new gorgonopsian, and more. Also, be sure to head on over to Spino Dude for the next video, covering the month of June and check out Paleoanalysis, who has covered April. Then on January 1st, you can see everyone's videos combined together and uploaded on Edge Science. The names and links to all the Paleo channels involved will be in the description below, so do be sure to check them all out. Anyway, here's the May Paleo Rewind 2023. Starting things off, on the 2nd of May, we had a very interesting paper that changed our understanding of the anatomy of Crassigerinus, an early tetrapod. Crassigerinus scoticus is known from fossils found in Scotland and Canada, dating to over 330 million years ago, and it was first described back in 1926. The new publication explained how previous reconstructions of this animal, which was a fairly large predator for its time, reaching up to 2 meters in length, had been based on specimens with incomplete and damaged skulls. This new research, though, used computed tomography methods to scan four different specimens and recreate the skull anatomy more accurately, finding that it actually had a much more flattened head than previous reconstructions. They also examined details of the jaw joints and the teeth, finding that Crassigerinus was a very capable aquatic predator that was adapted for taking out large prey. So it was a very interesting revision of a unique early tetrapod, and it was also very nice to see Jenny Clack on the authorship, a legendary early tetrapod worker who sadly passed away in 2020. Next up, there was also a paper describing a new species of saber-toothed cat published in May. Amphimachirodus hejangensis was named based on a skull found in northern China that dates to between 9.8 to 8.7 million years ago. This is now the most basal or primitive species of the Amphimachirodus genus found so far, and interestingly it has quite sideways oriented orbits for the eyes, suggesting this cat was better at observing its surroundings rather than singling out specific prey, which the authors interpreted as being an adaptation to an open environment, or an indication of social behaviour. More evidence for social behaviour in these cats comes from the description of a forepaw, attributed to the Amphimachirodus genus but not definitely to the same species, which shows a healed injury that would have badly impacted the individual's ability to hunt, and yet it obviously survived for a while after sustaining it, suggesting it may have been looked after by others. The study also analyses the rate of evolution of traits in these cats, finding that this new species represents an important transition that led to these animals adapting to open environments, and then eventually dispersing widely across the planet. It therefore seems as though the evolution of being suited to open environments and social behaviour occurred in this area near the Tibetan Plateau, as the region became more arid. A very significant paper there, with all sorts of implications for the evolution of this amazing group of animals. Also in May, we had a very intriguing new paper on the enigmatic Spinosaur Irritator Challengeri, which made some pretty interesting discoveries about the feeding habits of this animal. The fossils known for Irritator actually represent the most complete skull of any Spinosaur found so far, and so using microcomputer tomography scan data of the skull, the authors refined our understanding of the cranial anatomy of this Spinosaur. Some of the main findings included the discovery that Irritator would probably position its snout at an incline of around 45 degrees when it had to look closely at the things around it, since this allowed the snout to stop blocking the view from the eyes enabling for binocular vision, and therefore better depth perception. Another finding was that the jaws were suited to biting very rapidly, but relatively quite weakly, presumably an adaptation to catching fast-moving prey such as fish. But the most intriguing discovery, and something that's now inspired a great deal of paleoart, is that the lower jaw joints had a morphology that meant when the mouth was opened, 
the lower jaws would open out to the sides at the base, opening up the pharynx even wider. This sort of jaw function is also seen in modern pelicans, but through a different mechanism. So just to show that spinosaurs can get even more bizarre, it turned out they had giant pelican jaws too. It should also be noted that the publication of this paper resulted in a lot of discussion about the return of the irritator holotype back to Brazil, as it's currently housed in a museum in Germany. So another incredible development in the story of Spinosaur research. These dinosaurs really do never cease to amaze. Next up, we actually got a special report on the publication of some truly giant pliosaur vertebrae from the late Jurassic Kimmeridge clay formation of the UK, which also came out in May. We managed to get an interview with the lead author of this paper, Professor Dave Martill, who told us a bit about the background of this discovery and its significance to the ecology of late Jurassic oceans. You can see more of the interview in our 7 Days of Science episode on the discovery, but I thought it would be cool to include a little bit of it here too. Also, the interview was done while we were on a university field trip to Germany, so please excuse the slightly unusual setting. Anyway, here's me and the Boneheads crew with Professor Martil. So welcome everyone to this 7 Days of Science special interview with one of the authors of the new paper on this giant pliosaur, uh, Dave Martil, and we're just here to ask you a few questions about this spect uh, spectacular new find. So you're one of the advisors on Walking with Dinosaurs, famously <laughs> creating the, the giant Lyplerodon. Um, so how did that come about? Yeah, that's right. Well, thanks for inviting me along for a chat. That's good. That's good right. to see you guys. Um, when Tim Haynes was making the programme, he was uh, sort of, if you like, running wild, trying to find what would be the best way to approach this, what would be the best animals to have, and where could we film it, and what sort of themes could we use. And he sent a researcher out to speak to all sorts of people and to discuss this, and I suggested that maybe uh, they could use the Oxford Clay Sea as a theme. Uh, at first, they thought this was a bit strange because they were going to essentially do a programme containing lots of dinosaurs, uh, of which very few are marine. <laughs> and so he uh, asked about what sort of star animals he could have in the programme, and I suggested that there was some pretty impressive marine reptiles. And uh, when I told him about these animals, he seemed pretty impressed, uh, especially when I said that there were some giant pliosaurs uh, and a giant fish called Leedzichthys. Mm. And I gave him lots and lots of star animals to choose from, but of course budgets were limited for making the pilot program and a few things had to go, uh, but a few things were essential. And um, I took uh, Tim and the researcher to the Natural History Museum in London to show them some particularly large remains of pliosaurs that were very, very fragmentary. Liopleurodon had, had been, uh, complete or near complete skeletons of Liopleurodon had been found. And these animals are around about uh, six metres long or something like that. But because there are these other fragments that indicate even larger animals, um, we had a go at trying to calculate the size of these animals with these fragments. And we, we weren't being, trying to be particularly accurate. Uh, there wasn't that much data around to be able to do proper scaling. And so we came up with a figure that quite a few people accepted as around about 18 to 20 meters uh, as, as, as a large pliosaur. Yes. And not necessarily Liopleurodon because we're using bits and pieces that could have belonged to other genera. And there was also material from the Kimmeridge clay formations, particularly a very, very large lower jaw in Oxford, which is getting on mm. for sort of three meters long, huge thing, you drive yeah. a car into it. So what we did was we, we came up with this figure that I think, I think it was about, about 18 meters or something like that, 20 meters. Uh, and then we, we realised that the data set was incredibly small. There, there really weren't that very many specimens of, of these animals known. And so we thought, well, you know, when you look at sauropods, from the very first discoveries of things like Cetiosaurus, which are fairly small ones, they've, they've just progressively got bigger and bigger and bigger. More yeah. and more discoveries are made. Same is true of pterosaurs. And so we thought, well, maybe it's true of pliosaurs. So we added five metres. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We just added five meters. Yeah. And of course we got all sorts of criticism, but we never really got an opportunity to explain why we did that. We just thought we were preempting what might be discovered within yeah. the next hundred <laughs> years. And it just sort of it got it got put in there. Um, Meg Jacobs, who's one of the authors on the paper, um, wanted to go to Abingdon. Uh, to look at an ichthyosaur that they have and so I took her up there and while she was taking photographs of this ichthyosaur that's on display 
um, I noticed that there were some drawers underneath it, and they were there essentially for children who were visiting the museum to pull out and see yeah. see what it was. Though they were kind of going through the museum collection, and uh, in one of the drawers, I saw a, a huge vertebrae, and uh, it was sort of this sort of this sort of diameter. Wow. But I know I know pliosaur vertebrae. I, I, I've collected enough, excavated enough pliosaurs to recognise one of their neck vertebrae when I see them. Yeah, and I thought. That looks like a that looks like a pliosaur vertebrae. So I asked if I could have take it out of the drawer, and um, was given permission to do so. I photographed it, measured it, and everything. Mm. And and, he's, and the curator said to me, he said, "Well, we've got three more of these." <laughs> so we, but they were yeah. in another location. So right, we yeah. went back uh, and saw these other three, and they have got all of the hallmarks of cervical vertebrae of, 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 of a pliosaur. Yeah. Uh, but they're actually from different positions in the neck. Now this gives us an opportunity to actually scale up. Now since uh, you know the days of walking with dinosaurs in those early days, um, many more pliosaurs have turned up, especially in South America, with complete yeah. cervical series, and that gave us an opportunity to to scale up. But using some of these Cretaceous forms and late Jurassic forms, especially some stuff that's come from Mexico, places like that, we were able to to develop a, a range of figures, if you like, of which yeah. the top is something like 14, 14.2 meters, which is an astonishingly yeah, large right. animal yeah. if you think about it, and it's uh, way bigger than a killer whale, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's 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 the story. We we, yeah. we weren't excavating; we was <laughs> pulling drawers open <laughs> in a museum. Thank you again to Dave for doing that interview with us, and what an incredible discovery! May also saw the publication of a very cool new paper describing a new species of large-bodied Gorgonopsian from South Africa. Gorgonopsians are the infamous top predators of the late Permian, a lineage of synapsids related to our mammalian ancestors that could grow to some pretty big sizes. The largest known Gorgonopsian is the 3.5 metre long Inostrancevia, represented by fossils found in Russia, and now also South Africa. Three species of Inostrancevia were considered to be valid, all found in Russia, but this publication reported the first occurrence of the genus in South Africa, naming it as a new species Inostrancevia africana. This was a very interesting discovery for several reasons, as before that paper, the largest South African Gorgonopsians had all belonged to a lineage known as the Rubigianae, which are only known from Africa and have notably broader snouts compared to Inostrancevia. But the presence of Inostrancevia here too suggests that a faunal turnover occurred among the top predators late in the Permian as the infamous Great Dying approached. The paper showed that the Rubigians appear to have been an early casualty of the disruption of terrestrial ecosystems just before the end Permian mass extinction event and were actually replaced as top predators of the region by Inostrancevians migrating from elsewhere. But then the Inostrancevians soon fell victim to the extinction too, with all Gorgonopsians disappearing by the end of the Permian. And then a different synapsid group, the Therakophalians, replacing them as top predators here, and then also going extinct in the Triassic. The paper explains how this relatively rapid replacement of different top predator groups illustrates the ecosystem instability around this time, with large terrestrial carnivores being some of the most susceptible groups to these dramatic changes. An absolutely incredible discovery which significantly expanded our understanding of Gorgonopsian evolution and distribution, and provided a fascinating insight into sequential extinctions of these large vertebrates. Now, I bet you thought there would only be one Spinosaur paper in May, but nope, another new Spinosaur paper was also published, this one naming a new genus and species from Spain. Named Protaphlytus cincturensis, the genus name comes from the Greek for champion, and the material it's based on comprises a fragment of the right maxilla, an upper jawbone, and five tail vertebrae. Protaphlytus lived during the early Cretaceous, and it was classified as a basal member of the Baryonychian group of Spinosaurs, putting it as a close relative of Baryonyx, Ceratosuchops, and Suchomimus. The new species is from the same formation as Valibon of Anatrix, a Spinosaurine named in 2019 suggesting that the Iberian Peninsula was inhabited by a diversity of Spinosaurids, including members of both Spinosaurine and Baryonychine subfamilies. Later on in the Cretaceous, they then migrated to both Africa and Asia, and it seems that in Europe the Baryonychines became dominant, while the Spinosaurines became more abundant in Africa. An interesting new addition to the known Spinosaur diversity then. Also that month, a new genus and species of Mosasaur was named. Called Stellodens mysteriosus, 
This animal is based on fossils found in the latest Cretaceous phosphate deposits of Morocco, and represented by a partial jaw along with two teeth. These teeth have a very unique shape though, being triangular and with a series of elaborate serrated ridges on the side of the tooth that would have faced the tongue. This unusual tooth morphology is what's given it the name, with Stellidens mysteriosus translating to star tooth mystery. The function of these teeth in catching prey is not known, with the authors stating that it must have either had a highly specialised diet, a very specialised way of capturing prey, or a combination of both. The teeth don't seem to be particularly well adapted for catching fish or soft body cephalopods, and they are also not that well suited to crushing down on hard shelled prey. Hopefully more discoveries of this fascinating mosasaur can help to elucidate its diet. A new genus of Diprotodontid from Australia was named in May too. Diprotodontids were the biggest of the marsupials, including the well-known Diprotodon, which could reach the size of a rhino. This paper described some new material of a Diprotodontid called Zygomaturus kianii from South Australia, but found that this species is actually different enough from Zygomaturus trilobus, the type species of the genus, to be named as its own genus, and so it is now called Ambulator kianii. Looking at the characteristics of the limbs, the researchers found that Ambulator was graviportal, meaning it had adaptations for weight bearing, and found that it was better adapted to quadrupedal walking than earlier diprotodontids were. This might be explained by the change in habitats that occurred as more open environments spread across Australia, meaning these animals had to walk further to find food. One of the most amazing things about this new paper though, is the fact that they also described soft tissue structures associated with the fossil namely foot pads on the bottom of the left foot, showing how this animal supported itself on fleshy cushions. Sadly, the pads were actually prepped away from the fossil before they were recognised as soft tissue structures, and so they only exist in the CT scans of the fossil that were done before preparation. An absolutely amazing discovery of a new diprotodontid then, adding to the known diversity of these wonderful marsupials. And finally for the paleontological discoveries of May, we've got more fossils from Australia as the oldest pterosaur remains in the country were also reported. Coming from the Lower Cretaceous of Victoria, it's quite fragmentary but still clearly of pterosaurian origin. One of the fossils is a partial synsacrum, part of the hip, and the other is a left metacarpal fore, one of the bones of the wing. Characteristics of the bones mean that the synsacrum is from an indeterminate member of the Archaeopteridactyloids or the Pteranodontians, whereas the metacarpal cannot be determined beyond being a pterosaur of some sort. However, the metacarpal is quite different from such bones reported from Australia before by being much smaller, and so the researchers suspect it is from a juvenile individual. Although they're very isolated bones, they do extend the known range of pterosaurs in Australia both in time and geographically, showing that these animals were able to inhabit high latitude regions and adding to the growing understanding of Australian pterosaurs. So then, May was an action-packed month for paleontology this year, as indeed most months were. As I mentioned at the start, do be sure to check out Paleoanalysis for a review of April's discoveries, and watch out for Spinodude's video on June, which will be uploaded tomorrow. I really hope you enjoyed watching and let's hope 2024 is just as productive for paleontology.